Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. It's the monster from the swamp, Regis Ruguru Program. Hey, what's up? This is King Carlos Polina, former IBF world champ. This is Michael, the bounty hunter, 2012 Olympian and your people's champ. This is Charlie Edwards, flyweight champion of the world. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Coastman. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 253 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. I'm joined by, he's back, it's been a while, the former WBO Super Featherweight World Champion, Mr. Barry Jones. Barry, how are you, my man? Yeah, I'm good, Joe. Nice to have you back, mate. It seems like a lifetime since we spoke there. It's a long time. It's, it's certainly my pleasure to have you back. Let's start uh, with you, Barry, before we jump into the review part and the preview part and the rest of it. Um, it seems like you've been everywhere. You've been commentating on these Cold War <laughs> Al Siesta shows. You've been in Eddie Hearn's back garden. Uh, you're, you're doing a Sky podcast now. You know, just talk, talk to me a little bit about how you're, uh, you seem to be everywhere, every show you're at, Barry. <laughs> I, I, I'm, doing, I'm doing a Channel 5 show in, a, in, a, in, a, in a less than two weeks' time as well. So, I'm, yeah, I'm, uh, I seem to be. If, if my bank balance reflected, reflected how, how much people think that I'm uh, how busy I am, then I would be a very happy man. But, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm freelance like a, lot of, like a lot of guys who, who, are, who, who you see you know, um, on TV or listen to on radio. And we're freelance, so you work for whoever would, would, would be lucky enough to have you. Or you're lucky enough to have for them to want you, I should say. So yeah, I, I, I'll go wherever I'm, wherever I want. It. Some channels want me, and then they, then all of a sudden they don't want me, and then uh, and then another channel will say, well, we'll use you for a little bit. So yeah, so it's, uh, and it was nice to do some because I'm not really commentating on many shows since BT have sort of stopped using me. So it, it was nice to do the LCS shows, which were quite interesting, and I just started an NTK as well, which is a which was a good show the other week. So yeah. Oh, excellent. Getting better, getting after a real long period of doing nothing, like it was for everybody. It's it's slowly coming back to some sort of normality, which is which is quite nice. And uh, yeah, my bank manager is relatively pleased now for the first time for a long time. <laughs> well, I'm pleased to hear this, Barry, because like I say, you you're certainly you know one of the best pundits, analysis, whatever you want to call it. It, you know that we've got on on these shores, so it's good that you're busy. I'm happy. I'm happy for you. Um, let's get into this um, this the, the 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 review part, of course, where we're going to start Matrum Fight Camp um, last Friday, 14th of August. The bill topped by uh, Felix Cash and Jason Wellborn. Um, another win for Felix Cash, obviously now 13 and 0, still undefeated. A defense of his Commonwealth middleweight title had a point deducted in round five for a low blow. Um, you know, brave is well born, Barry. We know that obviously from his challenge against um, against Jarrah Hurd. You know, he's he's a tough guy, but a good win. Yeah, a good win nonetheless for Felix Cash. I think I think it was a good win, and uh, because he he never really before his last but one fight, he, Cash had looked fantastic. But I've said this already. But he's had he, but he's had everything his own way. So when he boxed Jack Cullen in the in the previous fight. That was his real first test against a guy who, who was coming 100% to win and was a give it all. And, and Cullen did give it his all. But I think Cash, really, really, I really sold on Cash after that fight because he didn't have it all his own way, but he persevered, still a class, and you know, showed good power, good skills, good patience in some of his work. But against Wellborn, he had a different sort of um, problems in front of him. He had a guy with plenty of experience, okay, probably on the wrong end of his career, well, certainly on the wrong end of his career. Now, maybe naturally a smaller guy as well, but he's been a middleweight champion, so you have to give him that credit. And and so yeah, he, he had you no. Know, but there was potential there to be in outman oh, in, in in a situation if, if it was a rogue. But Cash used that physical strength, the speed, and I, and again, you know, I thought he was he was fantastic. And and he hasn't really gone under the radar as such, but he never really gets mentioned with other names to Felix Cash very often. And I I guess that's a testament to his ability because. Sometimes when you see a, a, a youngster who's full of promise but not sort of like setting the world alight, but he's still you see he's still full of promise, you tend to just not mention his name and hope that he just disappears. And I think Cash maybe was falling into that trap, but now 
Um, unfortunately for for the middleweights around in the UK domestically, they're going to have to take note and, and take heed. Yeah, for sure. He's uh, you're right. You know, he doesn't really get mentioned amongst the top middleweights. Uh, you know, in Britain, but he is one of them. He's got the Commonwealth belt to prove that. Good win um, on the undercard of, of of course a brilliant fight between Zelfa Barrett and Eric Donovan. Obviously, Donovan being a real good amateur, um, probably losing the fight to be honest. Barrett actually when he when he got the stoppage. You know, it all seemed to go wrong for Donovan in the second half of the fight. Down twice in the seventh round, and then of course once. In the eighth and final round, that one as well for the vacant IBF Intercontinental Super Featherweight title, Zelfa Barrett, um, a guy I'm I'm really into. You know, I'm a big fan of. I've I've seen him, you know, develop over the course of the fights he's had. Obviously, that that loss to Ronnie Clark, I was in attendance for that one, and um, I, I'll always admire how he got dropped and got back up and went straight for him. You know, he showed a lot of heart there, and. Um, yeah, I'm excited to see what the future brings for him. Also, a good win on the undercard for Kieran Conway, now 15-1 and one with a draw. Unanimous decision over 10 against Navid Mansouri. That one was for the vacant WBA Intercontinental Super Welterweight title. Uh, an upset loss. Um, not not in everyone's eyes, though. A lot of people were, were, were piling the money on Rachel Ball, who pulled off the upset. Now 6-1. and one. Um, A loss for Shannon Courtney. Um, Courtney, of course, down in the first round. Brilliant left hook from Rachel Ball. Um, to be completely honest, it was an eight two-minute round contest, Barry. I wasn't strictly scoring it, but I don't know. Maybe you think Ball won, you know, was a deserved winner. I thought it was really close. They could have given it to, to, to Shannon, I felt. They could have, but I, I, I thought that Ball won the fourth, I think it was. And I think that was the wrong way. I think Matt Macklin on, on commentary for Sky gave maybe the Latin, the rest of the rounds to uh, to Courtney pretty much. But I, I thought the fourth, except for the last one, I think or the last two, I thought the fourth round was the wrong where I thought Ball just nicked it, and I think that's what I gave it. Just just gave her the win. That's with the, obviously the two point round in the first round. Chan, Courtney won more rounds, but it, it was a risk. And the thing with Courtney, she does loads of good stuff, and then just some terrible stuff. And that's the problem. And, and one of the worst things she does is stand in front. I, I pick Ball to win. I, I, I've been doing these um, preview and review shows for Sky, um, for these lockdown shows with, with Matt Macklin. And, and I said I fancy Ball just because of the height and she punches long. And I don't think Ball boxed particularly good, actually. I've seen her box better. But, and that maybe down to Courtney because Courtney, she did Courtney really hit hard. And, but I think she dined out on a power too much, Courtney, where she could use her box skills a bit more and be a bit more... She does this head movement, and it's good, and it works. But there's just a rhythm to it. There's no real thought behind it. She's not slipping punches. She's just doing the, what she does in the gym, which is not always a bad thing, but it's all about where she can throw her next punch. So I, I just think she didn't get found out as such, but I just think she came unstuck because of, of the lack of defensive um, adhesion, I guess. She's, it's not know-how. She just didn't, she doesn't really care about defense. She's always looking to hurt you. And I, and I understand that with power punches. But I thought it, I thought she lost, to be fair. But, but I wouldn't have argued either way. I think it was that close to fighting. But and a good fight. And another, another. she talked about women's boxing, people are trying to ram women's boxing down people's throats. And I think that's the wrong way about it. I, I think that's another good women's fight that we've seen on the trot consecutive, consecutively now after, after obviously, the, of course, the Harper-Jonas fight, which was, was fantastic to watch. And we'll have the next week, of course, with, with Pasoon and Taylor. That's never near as good as the first one. And I think that's important for women's boxing, not to ram it on people, so it's force them to like it, because then people will naturally repel. Let the boxing speak for itself. Let the boxing be so good or so competitive that you... You gender doesn't become an issue, and that will help the women's sport grow. And that will help just it will just be boxing and not women's boxing. I think that's that's the important part for them, for that sport, for the women, and for the women to earn more money and be more popular. Yeah, you're 100 percent right. And of course, you know you, you <laughs> failed to mention the uh, the the Brackhouse McCaskill fight, which we'll get onto shortly. But um, another another yeah. brilliant fight for women's boxing. But yeah, you're right. You know Courtney, um, you know she was battling the the disadvantage of the height difference, which which was crazy when I saw the pair next to each other. And to her credit, she, when yeah. she got dropped, she got back up and went right for ball. 
but um, yeah, you, you know, it was a, it was a real close fight. A good win on the undercard for John Doherty, now nine and zero, a seventh round TKO against Anthony Fox, leaving the uh, the matchroom square garden there. Though let's move now to York Hall Bethnal Green. Um, no crowd, of course, once again. Uh, it looked a little bit strange, actually, seeing it on TV. But let's talk about this one. <laughs> um, Archie Sharp, let's start with him. He's going to be on the show shortly. Um, I think we've got two interviews, maybe even three, maybe, maybe even four. We'll see. But at this stage, Archie Sharp will be on soon. He's now 19-0, and a points win for him against Jeff Afori. Very, very close. Um 96-95, Marcus McDonald's card, the referee. Um, that was simply because he gave a 10-10 round, you know? So it just goes to show how close yeah. that one was. Jeff Afori and Archie, though, um, you know, they've done tons and tons of sparring. So, it's, it's as you know, Barry, it's hard to kind of look good against a guy that knows you inside out, you know? So it was a tough learning fight. A lot of people think Afori could have, could have even perhaps nicked it. I don't think so. Um, what's your take on it? Did you see it? No. I, I, yeah, I did. I thought Chad just done enough, but he didn't box great. But I did say, I remember speaking to John Rowling because he didn't know too much about Fory. And I, and I um, prior to a couple of weeks ago, and I did say to him, because he's working the, sh- the show, of course, I said, this is a, that's the fight of the night. That's, that's really, except before Troy Williamson and, and Harry Scarf was announced, it was just Troy Williamson against, against the, to be named. Then I sort of said that that's, that's potentially the fight of the night because... You know, Phantom's fight was an easy fight, and I, I couldn't see O'Connor was going to lose. It's just how good he would look. But I thought that fight was the one that was going to be really competitive. And it wasn't the greatest of fights, but it was competitive. And, and yeah, but it, and it's a nice, it's a good fight for Sharp because it's, 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 uh, it's like a check for him where he really is in his career. You know, you, got, you can get carried away with your own hype, and it looked fantastic, and he had looked really good. He, got some really, he had some really good wins of late. So he starts call he starts doing what everyone does nowadays and calling for the top fighters, which is your job to do, but you have to be realistic about it. And I think that fight's made me think, hang on a minute. No, I'm going in the right direction, but I'm I'm a million miles away from from looking to fight the, the top tier in, in, in my division. And and so that that's not a bad fight. It's a learning fight where he thinks actually I've got a lot to learn. Yeah. So so yeah. So 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 really, they they'd be happy with that. I think no, not happy with the performance, but happy with the you know, where we have to develop. There's loads of things you can look at that fight, and and, and also the, in these times now, how you, how you used to boxing for the crowds, maybe, and, and like you said, they've been sparring partners, so maybe some complacency. But then you know that that disrespects uh, Jeff Afori's effort as well. To be fair. You know, he came in an underdog, he, he gave it his all, he made it as hard as he possibly could for Sharp, and also he could read some of the things Sharp was doing because of, as you already mentioned, those, those wrongs of spying they've done, where they sort of know your little your little quirks, your little uh, habits before you throw a punch and so on. So, yeah, it was, it was a good learning fight for, for, for Archie Sharp. Yeah, and, and also a four, you know, he's he's kind of got this reputation of coming in with a few days' notice and upsetting the apple cart at times as well. So he had plenty of notice for this one, and, uh, you know, it was a good version of a yeah, well, I, and, sorry. Go on. Yeah, well, I, I was up in Liverpool where he beat uh, oh, Jed Carroll, I think he beat, and um, and then the CT kid up in, up, in, up, in, up in the Olympia in Liverpool on an MTK show, and he came in at, late, at relatively late notice to be a guy who just give him a few rounds, and... and and went and just dug it out. You know, the physical strength he used, and and he deservedly got the win. So I knew it was going to be a, a potentially a dangerous fight for Sharp. So yeah, he, he did his job and it just fell short. Yeah, Archie Sharp, very uh, honest in the post-fight interview as well. But moving on from that, um, yeah, again, also, he was supposed to be main event when it was first announced. Then, uh, you know, Troy Williamson got his opponent then on jumped Carl and... Uh, and, and, and Michael Conlon. But anyway, Troy Williamson, a good win for him. Unanimous uh, decision over 10 against Harry Scarf. Another good win for Troy Williamson, really. A guy that, um, you know, has to start getting in these conversations now again with some of the sort of top guys domestically. The IBF European super welterweight champion. Um, wasn't, wasn't, you know, it wasn't an easy win for him, but a good learning fight again. 15-0 and with a draw. Um, Harry Scarf 8-2. and Um... Dennis McCann, I didn't, I don't think they televised it, but a good win for him, a KO against Brett Fido in two rounds. Not everyone stops Fido. Um, Dennis McCann seven and zero since the fight. Fido's come out and said that um, you know McCann he believes is real special. You know, comparing him to the other guys that he's obviously gone on the road and lost against, he rates him highly. 
Um, a good win, of course, for Carl Frampton. We sort of knew what was going to happen. A bit of a tick-over type fight. Obviously, a late replacement. You've got to give credit to Darren Trainer, even for, I suppose, getting to the seventh round where the TKO came. He was down in the sixth. Um, those those body shots were vicious from Carl Frampton. That was his 30th fight there, 28-2. and two. Um, and Michael Conlon now 14-0 and 0 again. He managed to get him out of there to Cooch. It wasn't as easy as, of course, Josh Warrington did um, in a couple rounds or one round, I think it was. But, you know, Michael Conlon, it was all his own way to Cooch. Again, I think had, had quite a bit of notice, turned up, seemed to really, really tough it out. Came with a lot more motivation than he did, it seemed, for the world title shot he got, you know. But um, a point deducted as well in the fourth and fifth rounds for Conlon. He was hitting him low a few times there. Uh, do you want to give any words on that before we move on to the, uh, the American shows? Yeah. A few rounds. It wasn't, it wasn't a few low punches. It was continuous low punches. Steve, there from, Steve, from Bunce did it. Steve Bunce said it right afterwards, didn't he? He pulled him up about it. and <laughs> They were saying, yeah, one or two strung a bit low. And he said, what about the other 48? <laughs> <laughs> But you know, and but he looked good. That was a good. That was a good win for him. I think you know. I, I think also you got to keep in mind where how easily Josh Warren got rid. Of, Josh Warren got rid of him. So you know, but obviously you know, I think Conlon convenient. I'm not convenient. I feel like I'm digging him out. No, Navarrete's moved from super middleweight, super bantamweight to featherweight. He's come down to super bantamweight, which is not a bad move to be honest. <laughs> I would. Uh, I'm not saying he's avoiding um, Emmanuel Navarrete, but. If you can pick up a world title without that, without having to go through him, I think that's a, an ideal solution for anyone. He's, he's a bit of an animal. So if he can make Super Band made safely, then that, you know, you, you might be a force to reckon with because he's on the verge of that sort of world level now, I think, uh, is Michael Conlon. Frampton, I did treat something else, even though Fra- I couldn't see Frampton trainer being com- remotely competitive. But it's always good to see Frampton back because he's got big fights ahead of him and, and, and he's a big name and he's beat the big figures because of Frampton, to be fair. But Trainer's a good fight, a good fighter domestically, but he was never going to really trouble Frampton. So it, it was almost like a non-entity, to be honest, that fight. And Troy Williamson, I've been, I've been banging the Troy Williamson drum for, for, since he turned pro. And it reminds me of Liam Williams. I did the same for Liam Williams years ago when, when in the old Box Nation days where you'd be on early before TV when and bear in mind Box Nation was sure almost every fight on the bill and, and, and he would miss Williams. He'd miss it he'd miss it every time. And I, I used to be saying to people above me, This is the kid you've got to be pushing, I tell you. And then nobody listened. But you know, now Williams is on his way, flying and you know and I, and I don't feel like I, I deserve credit for that, but I, no one was no one was t- taking a blind notice of him. And I think I thought that was Troy Williamson. And he had this opportunity the other night. I don't Mr. Harry Scarf's a good fighter and he'll give and he'll give you plenty of problems. But I don't think Troy Williamson boxed great, particularly. And you know, and I and I feel sorry because that was his big opportunity to really show how good he was. I don't think he did himself justice and I hope that's not the, the last opportunity that he gets. Because sometimes that can happen. They go, though well, everyone's banging on about this kid, let's put him on and show what he got. And then you go, well, he wasn't that great after all. You no, know, because obviously they'll, they'll compare what Anthony Fowler did to, to, to Scarf and, and, and they'll go, well, he handled it a lot easier. So it'll be, the comparisons are always made. So that was his chance and he didn't sort of take it. So I hope he gets another opportunity because I've seen Troy Williamson really look the business and then, uh, yeah, I don't know whether it's a mental thing with him or whatever, but he needs, he needs to be on point every time he fights. I think that's important. Yeah, like Archie Sharp, I suppose, a win that you're going to really learn from. So all the best to Troy. Um, yeah. Moving out now stateside to Connecticut. This one, I doubt you saw, Barry, to be honest. I had to stream it. Um, Benavidez, I don't think you've seen that, did you? No, I never. Okay. No, I haven't seen any, unfortunately, no. Because oh, we have kind of no, no, I don't know if the zone is doing like a beat to test. Yeah. So you can, you can, yeah. If you if you were lucky enough to be selected, I think you could watch them in the UK to to the zone. Yeah, no, this ain't. No, not not that one. This not that one. Yeah. But the, yeah. Yeah, no, because this ain't the zone card. I was just going to say this is the PBC no. one. But I'll fly through yeah. here. Um, the Mohegan Sun Casino. Um, obviously, the bill topped by David Benavidez, twenty-two and zero, and Roma Alexis Angulo, twenty-six and one. A big puncher. Angulo, kind of known for obviously upsetting Anthony Sims Jr. and taking his o, um, Eddie Hearn's uh, super uh, light heavyweight prospect. So, uh, yeah, um, obviously this one was for the vacant WBC super middleweight world title because David Benavidez came in overweight and sacrificed the title on the scales, unfortunately. Um, 
So <laughs> the, the belt only at stake for Angulo, but yeah, wasn't competitive at all, to to be completely honest. Um, Benavidez, for me, one of my absolute favorite fighters to watch. Um, you know, brilliant elusiveness he showed in in that fight on, on the weekend. He picks his shots brilliantly. He's got such an exciting style. He kind of fires from the hip. He isn't afraid to take one to give one. He's got that natural power in both hands. He's a good judge of distance. It's just a, a shame because twice now he's lost his belt outside of the ring. The first time for cocaine, the second time for uh, for missing the weight. So, um, yeah, it's just a real shame. Cause well, on the back of that now, a little bit of news um, Barry, is that the WBC are now ordering uh, Canelo against Yildirim. Whether it will actually happen or not, I'm not sure. But Yildirim would have been the mandatory. Benavidez, we had him on last week or the week before. He was saying after he gets this fight out of the way, he's got to defend next against Yildirim. Now he's out the picture. It seems like Canelo Yildirim has been ordered. <laughs> no one wants to see it. Uh, uh, it's, it. No one wants to see it. Like... <laughs> Clearly, we see it. A funny thing, they, they, everyone wants to win that WBC title. Then I, I understand the reason why, but they're becoming a bigger lack of laughing stock from the WBA, and they're and they're fourteen champions per week because they're all doing matches at the wrong time, like at this time. Like, what, what are they all doing that for? And why is Canelo a two? Why is Canelo middleweight champion and, and super middleweight champion? I thought that wasn't allowed. I, I don't. I don't see how it all works. I, I, it's just. It's ridiculous. Like, no. like somebody put, I think Sam Jones, the manager of Joe Joyce, put about, I'd like to see Canelo, with all this Canelo, who's going to fight Canelo, who's going to fight Canelo, you know, Saunders and Smith and Ryder was even mentioned you know, on Twitter. And he put something like, I'd like to see Billy Joe, I'd like to see Eubank Jr. with him. You know, that's a, I think that's a great fight. And I, and I sort of scoffed it, really, to be honest, me and many others, just saying, it's not competitive. He, he, he couldn't be competitive against Canelo. And he couldn't be. The, the speed and the athleticism, to, and, he, and he'd be brave and tough. But he would, no. What can he do? That, what can he do that Daniel Jacobs can't do? What could he do that, that Golovkin can't do? I, I, I couldn't see it, you know? And so this fight now, someone who's, who, 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 who Eubank Jr. has wiped the floor with, relatively, then what, what does this do? I know. Mr. Canelo's resume is, is, is phenomenal. It's absolutely fantastic. And everyone deserves an easier fight, but not, not in these sort of times now, not with the money the zone are paying you. That's where, so that's where some of the zone are paymasters. They should step up and say, I don't care what title, what, the title's irrelevant to us, my friend. We're paying you hundreds of millions of dollars to fight in competitive fights. We, you know, who's going to want to tune in to watch that? To be honest, you, know, you tune if you're a boxing fan just to see Canelo, but like, you know, he has drawing, he has, you know, he's the biggest draw in, in world boxing, but he has limits. Yeah, it has limits. If he's boxing, if he's boxing a Saunders or he's boxing a, a Callum Smith, then you know, they go, oh, another champion undefeated, you know, and 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 that, and you know, and that that draws that draws other fights, or even Golovkin again, who you know he's he a massive favorite this time to win the third time, but still, you know, those fights are always going to be competitive. Not this guy, he wipes the floor with him. I don't, he plays with him and he finishes the fight whenever he wants to and that's not a fight that you're going to want to pay a pay-per-view or a subscription for and certainly the zone not going to want to give him whatever for that, whatever would be, that fight would be probably anywhere within the region of 20 to 50 million <laughs> for that. I, and, that and that's what the WBC, they, they've done it with Dillian White with this no, Dillian White deserves his world title shot because he's been the mandatory champion since I was 15. But, you know, it's, where does it, you know, now they've ordered that fight when we're so close to getting Fury and Joshua, a unified champion at heavyweight, the heavyweight division, you know, rule boxing you know, in many ways. So if they get a unified champion in the heavyweight division, there's hope for every division. And, and, the, and, they, and, they, and they gotta then order no, they're, they're showing integrity and saying Dillian White will be the next guy who fights the winner of Fury and Wilder next. He will be. Well, that's that's just going to fragment the fight, the the the, the titles. I don't. Good luck to Dillian White. I wish him all the best. But, but as boxing in the whole, it got to be Joshua next. It got to be. I like, forget Uzik and White. You know, it got to be Joshua and Fury next. It has to be. Why? Why would they want to do? Why would they want to punch themselves in the face again? And boxing as boxing sport as the sport constantly does, and that. And this is another example with, with Canelo, just constantly just making things worse. And I don't know whether they just think controversy sells because you know put him in with a put him in with a featherweight. Then you know well, where does it end? Where does it end? I, I'll rant about this all day. You better stop because you know 
Yeah. It's the most beautiful sport on the planet to me, but it constantly shoots itself in the face. And and then you get other sports like UFC, which is nothing, which is has no real correlation with boxing at all. It's just another combat sport. To, you know, I don't know what judo do pipe up or anything else, but they start saying about well, we don't have this problem in our sport, and they don't. Obviously, because they, they, they don't, you know, the UFC is a monopoly, so they, they own everything. You, know, you have no rights at all, really, like, in many ways. It's almost like a Gestapo of sports, but at least they have competitive fights constantly. That's, but, I mean, on paper. So, you know, if, you, if, you're, if, you're deserve, if you deserve a chance, you get your chance. I think. So I'm not a fan of UFC. I don't watch it too much, if at all. But at least if you, could, if, you're, if you deserve an opportunity, you get it. When in boxing, that's never the case. Very rarely the case. Yeah. No, hopefully we don't see it. Like I said, the WBC have ordered it. Hopefully it doesn't end up getting made. And you're right, you know, everyone wants to win that title and they're, they're getting worse, you know, get, getting as bad as the WBA. My favourite title organisation is the WBO and that's been the way since uh, December 19th, 1997, Barry. Yeah, no, do you know what? It was, it, it was my favourite as well. It was 19, just for Christmas, it was. It was my favourite. But, you know, that was a lot... Listen, that was a laughing stock to start with, and it's only a few. I, it's only a few years younger than the IBF. To be honest, people don't realise how close. It's only like three or four years apart where, where they they both where they were both established. So it's not a huge difference there. Yeah. But there was no need for either one of those, really. It, that's the problem. There shouldn't have been a need for one of either one of those. That's the truth, to be honest. And, and but listen, we benefit from it. Loads of British fighters benefit from those both those organisations, but. The WBA is ridiculous with all those champions. Is Nathan Cleverley is Wales is only two time world champion. But is he? Because he beat he beat a he beat a regular champion, not the super champion. And does that mean anything? It was hard to it's hard I don't know. Yeah, so these people winning world titles now, and I don't know if they are genuine world cha- world, t- world champions anymore. It's almost like Kevin Mitchell put something on Facebook the other day. How will I be remembered? And I even remember as being, as never winning, as being a, a fantastic fighter, half on his sleeve, you know, give it his all, great to watch. You know, one of the best British fighters to never win a world title, not the best, but one of them in the in the conversation. But it doesn't matter that winning a world title thing, though, because it, it, I think it's, it's losing his credence, that, that, that world title, that tag, that world title tag. Look at Dillian White, he's made millions, he's not, he's not, he's not winning the world title. I think it's proven you don't need it. Yeah. It's proven you don't need it. Look at Callum Smith. He made millions, for, and he made millions from our World Boxing Super Series or whatever it was called. And he only boxed one world class fighter. Yeah. No, it's not his fault. He's a he's a fantastic fighter. But what I mean is, it sort of showed he didn't need a tag. He didn't need that, that world title tag. He only when he when he boxed George Groves was the only it was the first time he boxed a world class fighter. So you know, and he made millions on the sport, but from just boxing, it's almost the world title is almost now as uh, uh, a, a second thought, really. And I think that might be the way forward that we that we go back to the old-fashioned um, journalist picking, like it used to be the turn of the last century, where you know, journalists would decide who was the world champion. <laughs> All right, well, let's get back to track. Know, <laughs> this is on this is on track. This is a boxing discussion on a boxing podcast. I know. I don't want to praise your podcast up now and then you poo poo all my conversations. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you know, just on that on that Benavidez card, um, you know, m- numerous times throughout the fight, Benavidez would sort of land the combination while being stood right in front of Angulo. Then he'd take half a step back at the right time. Angulo missed with a wild hook. Then Benavidez would step right back in and unload another combination. You know, he's got so much to like that kid. But um, moving down that card, moving down that card. Um, an unfortunate sort of fight, really, for um, for Alontes Fox, who, of course, we last saw getting really battered by um, by, by Liam Williams. Um, Alontes Fox, it, it was a no contest after three rounds, an accidental head clash um, against Habib Ahmed, who, of course, was 27-1 and one with a draw. He'd only lost to Gilberto Ramirez for the world title, so I was really intrigued to see how that fight would play out, but we never got to see it. Um, Fox now 26 and 2 of course with a draw and no contest doesn't count on the record but um, a tough week a tough 7 days for the Fox brothers because his his, um, younger brother Michael Fox as well got upset last weekend um, also on the undercard there Otto (laughs) Wallin sorry his brother's called called Michael Fox yeah 
Oh, fantastic. Like Michael J. Fox, like Back to the Future. Yeah, I mean, it's spelt That's different, fantastic. but you know. Fantastic. He's, I'll tell you about, it's another conversation Sorry. for another day, but Michael mm-hmm. Fox, just a real mm-hmm. quick summary, uh, Barry. Terrible amateur, yeah. and, I, and I say that, he's a friend of mine. Terrible amateur, 100 mm-hmm. fights, 60 losses and 40 wins. He turns pro, wow. racks up a, a, a bunch of wins, boxes the 2016 Olympic gold medalist, beats him in a pro ring. Um, he's turned his career wow. around in the pros. Honestly, real. real no, so brilliant. And like, Fantastic. like Alontes Fox, you know, he towered over Williams. Uh, Michael Fox is 140 yeah. pounds, 10 stone, and he's six foot three and a half, something like that. He's a giant as well, you know. So, oh, unbelievable. Yeah, so. Freaking nature. Yep. You, you're three rounds up. You're three rounds up before you start. <laughs> when, you, when, you got, when you got that, when you're that size. He always seems to be on the B side. He's had a couple dodgy decisions including that one last weekend he was dropped in the first round but anyway it's oh. another story he's, he's hasn't yeah. had it all his own way also on this undercard Benavidez Otto Wallin picked up a win against Travis Kaufman a TKO in five rounds the referee stopped the contest after Kaufman injured his left shoulder he couldn't lift up his left arm at all and the referee just said he literally said I've, 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 you know you can't defend yourself properly that's it so um, yeah he lost every round Kaufman unfortunately Otto Wallin good win 21-1 moving on now to Tulsa this one was the DAZN card going to fly through this as well um, wins for Nikita Ababi now 9-0 and a 6 round unanimous decision for him against Jarvis Williams who's 8-2 and two with a 8-3 and three with a draw uh, Raymond Ford picked up a win against Eric Manriquez. He's now 6-0. and That was unanimous over six rounds. Shakram Giasov now 10-0, and double figures. A win for him, a KO for him in three rounds against Wiston Campos, who um, gave Josh Kelly a tricky fight. It went the distance um, when he boxed him. But, um, yeah, good win there for Giasov, 10-0, and like I say. And top of the bill, Cecilia Brackhouse against Jessica McCaskill. Um, for the WBC, WBA, IBF, WBO and IBO female welterweight titles. McCaskill moved up in weight. Of course, we've seen her lose to Katie Taylor, but she's come on leaps and bounds since then, and she's now undisputed. Um, Unbelievable. Cecilia Brackhouse, I was supposed to have her on last week's show. It didn't quite go to plan. 36-1 and now, loses um, all the belts, and a win here would have taken her, Barry, to... Because she she tied the record for the most success, uh, consecutive successful defenses. She tied it 25 with Joe Lewis from 72 years ago. A win here would have put her one ahead of him in her own league. Wow. But um, she, she lost it at the, at the final gallop there to McCaskill, who you've just got to give so much credit to. What an inspiration. She used to live on the street. She was homeless. Turned her career around. I think she's got a couple of daughters, perhaps. And um, just, you know, what a fighter. Now... You know, now the undisputed champion at welterweight, I believe, in her first fight at the weight. So it's just remarkable. So, bo- boxing is, is one of the very few sports you, that you get stories like that. People living off the streets, you know, or, you know, you literally, one one night can change your life. You get you get one one night can change your career path, but I, I mean, literally change your life. I, and and it's very few sports that can do that. They're mainly combat sports. I think boxing is, is, it might be the only one. It's just phenomenal. But but I didn't see the fights obviously because it was on the zone. But I did see the interview with Sirius Brackett after, and it was just you just go wow, what a fantastic human being, gracious in defeat. You no, know, didn't want to take any credit away from from McCaskill's. But you no, know, listen, hang on, I just wish it all the best. Good luck. And and and, and apparently it was a close fight. You know, and she was what maybe right to maybe think she was unlucky. You no, know, in a close fight that that happens where you know a lot of people would be going. I thought I'd done enough and talking about yourself. She just put all the credit to the champion. And and I just thought, what a beautiful person. What a beautiful person. That that's how you. That's how you. That's how you make the sport grow. With, with respect like that for me. I thought I, I tweeted her. She don't. I, I haven't met her. I don't know her from Adam. But I, I said, listen. The, but the way you, the way you conduct yourself, is how every champion should. Really, is your credit to the sport. Yeah. No, certainly I echo that. And it was a real close fight. Um, yeah. You know, she is. I think thirty nine next month, though. So you know, she is getting to the tail end. But what a champion she's been. And if she decides to fight again, then she'll she'll have even more supporters than last time. But um, yeah, that's. I tell you something, though, so, Joe. Tell you something, mate. We missing this box nation because we, we would have had at least one of those shows on oh, on the, on the weekend so for bad. sure. You miss you miss this. 
I know it was a laugh stuff to a lot of people because you know the, the budget wasn't great, but all these fights now we don't get to see. Like we just don't get to see, and it, and it, it's heartbreaking. I really I really miss those international comps. And I, like I don't I don't live stream. I can't I can't cope. I can't do that illegal streaming stuff because. It, it play, it play, I tried it once a long time when it plays up and I get oh, frustrated. Let me interrupt so you and I, tell I you this, Barry. It. Let me interrupt you and tell you this. I bought the Joshua yeah. Ruiz one pay-per-view at my house. My dad was at his house. He streamed yeah. it. And he rung me and said, my stream's just crashed. Um, Joshua's just put Ruiz down. Is he going to knock him out? I said, what? He goes, he's just, he's just, you know, he's just been dropped. I went, who's been dropped? He went, Joshua's just dropped Ruiz. I went, no, no, no. You're about a round behind. Ruiz has just dropped Joshua twice. You know, it was like, that's how bad it can can screw you over, you know? Yeah. I can't do this. Yeah, so yeah, I, that, yeah, I can't do it. It's no good to me. I can't do it. I I only do it if I really But but that's, 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 yeah, but uh, yeah, you got to call for your research and your work, of course. Yeah, and I'll, I'll watch it when it comes on YouTube, like a couple of day, a couple of, a week later. So I, I guess it's still technically illegal, maybe. But you know, if it goes on, then I see it. I'll watch it. But yeah, it's, it's a it's a bit of a pity. But anyway, it's um, yeah, box you crack on, mate. I just want to I just I just want to interrupt you. I just want to interrupt you every sort of five minutes. That's all. So I like the sound of my own voice. You know that. But no, Box Nation was. It was the reason I had Sky. It was the reason I had a TV. It was. It was the only channel I ever watched. It's, it's sorely missed in my household. Not so much by my missus, I don't think. But um, I. It's not. My life hasn't been the same without it. Right. That's it, though, for the review part of the show. Just before we wrap this up, the final thing to do is to welcome our first guest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the reigning WBO European Super Featherweight Champion. It is, of course, Mr. Archie Sharp. Arch, welcome back on the show, my man. Thanks for having me on, mate. Thank you. Always a pleasure. So, Arch, we last did an interview in uh, in January properly, a proper interview. At that point, um, you know, you'd, you believed at the time you'd be boxing in, in April. Of course, that fight fell through. Then we hosted a podcast together in May, which was fun. At that point, you thought you'd be boxing in July, but that also fell through. You finally have had a fight. Third time lucky. A win over Jeff Afori on points on the weekend. Tell us about it, Arch. Um, yeah, so we picked up a win. Um, it was a clo- I made a very, very close and hard night uh, with the fight. Uh, but yeah, we got the win, we got back in the ring, and then uh, now it's time to, to put that one past me and move on. And obviously, Jeff Afori, you know, he's a good fighter, he's better than his record suggests, he's, you know, he's turned up on a couple of days' notice in previous fights and caused upsets more than once. Uh, he's the kind of guy who, you know, he's always on the on the kind of B side, if you like, of things, but... You know, he's better than he gets credit for. He's better than he gets respect for. But this fight in particular, he had plenty of notice. So we saw a good version of a Afori in there on Saturday night, Archie. Perhaps a better version than, than fans even knew existed. Um, exactly that. And that's why I can't take it away from Jeff. Uh, he obviously got himself in, in great shape. Like you say, had loads of time to prepare for the fight. Um, but for myself... I don't, I, the fight never went out. I wanted it to go. I never boxed nowhere near what I could box. Um, and like I said, I made a very hard night. And I haven't even watched it back yet. I refuse to watch it back at a minute. I'll give it a week before I sit down and have a little look. And again, some people won't understand this, but it's important to let them know, Arch. But you and Jeff have, have, have shared many rounds sparring. So you know each other inside out kind of thing. It's it's always difficult to look good against a guy that knows you so well. Not only that, but you know, you know better than most. It's it's a mental challenge boxing more than anything else. And sometimes you kind of need that fear of losing. I don't know if you really had that going into the fight on Saturday night. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head there. I don't really, I don't think I had that fear of losing at all to Jeff. Um, and to be honest, I don't feel like I've had that fear in the last couple of fights which probably has made me start looking like an ordinary fighter, if you like. Um, that's probably what the most frustrating thing is, because I know my ability, I know how unorthodox I am, I know my skill levels, but unfortunately I haven't shown that in the last couple of fights now, um, which has really given me a kick up the arse, if you like, because I really need to get back to my boxing and showing my unorthodox side of things and how much of a talent I am. But like I say, the last couple of fights I haven't been able to do so. We spoke on, on Fight Week over the phone and you pretty much said, you know, Afori doesn't really have the 
you know the boxing skills to beat me but he is fit as a fiddle and and that seemed to to really be your own sort of real worry going in did you try and pace yourself at times in the middle of the fight arch at all was that was it playing on your mind maybe for the later rounds at all honestly do you know what it is me personally because there's a lot of things now come on away from saturday um straight away i went straight to the drawing board and I'm making big changes as we speak at the minute um, to see the best Archie Sharp. And me personally, I believe I peaked too early for that fight. Um, I left it all in the gym. I was, I felt, I felt the pace after four rounds, um, which ideally for me I should have went Tenerife, come back, box probably within the week, week and a half from being back from Tenerife. Um, but I think three weeks after me coming back from camp. Just I just left it all in the gym. I really do think that. I think I left it all in the gym, peaked too early, um, and got the time got the time management wrong for this fight. And you've got to be excused for that, because like I say, some fans won't understand this this body peaking thing. But you know, physically, fighters, you know, they try to to, to time the 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 peaking of their body perfectly, and it's hard to do it for fight night at the best of times. But like we mentioned, you've had to pretty much peak and unpeak three times in in basically one long training camp since the start of this this lockdown. You know, so your excuse for that is it's, it's hard to do it the best of times, Arch. It was a challenge in itself that. That's a challenge in itself, yeah, you're right. It's hard trying to get the right time when when, when you come to peaking. But um, one minute I was fighting in July, then I'm fighting at the end of July, then it's August, and it's this, then it's that. It was a bit up and down. Um, so by the time I booked the Tenerife trip, I was supposed to be fighting on the 25th of July. Then when I was out there, they rung and brought it back to the 15th. Uh, sorry, the 20th, and they brought it to the 15th, um, which... I wanted it closer, do you know what I mean? If they brought it back to the 1st of August, it would have been even better. But, uh, but yeah, it's just one of them things I've had to learn, getting the time management right for sure for next time because at the end of the day, that's so important and it just goes to show the importance of that. Um, I left it all in the ring after four rounds. My body would not do what I wanted it to do. First couple of rounds, I had my head to pace. Um, first couple of rounds, and then started getting the move on because it inspired me. I've been cruising... I'm cruising, do you know what I mean? In, in my camp, I had an unbelievable camp. The numbers were phenomenal. Yeah. And again, what was it like to fight without a crowd? Because again, your your ringside support usually is, is very vocal and it gives you that lift. Yeah, that, like um, people have said to me, Arch, you look like you didn't want to be in there. Uh, and there was a time where I said to Richard, I think, you know, I said, a couple more rounds, mate, we're going home. That's not the sort of attitude you should be having halfway towards the end of a fight, do you know what I mean? But that's where I... I kind of got to, and I'm not, not excusing that because of the crowd, but it was very unusual, um, a lot different. So mentally, I don't think I'd say I was in the fight. It just, everything was, yeah, very unusual, leading up, staying away from home four days before the fight, having to self-quarantine, um, self-isolate. So all, all of these little factors all play a part, but at the end of the day, it's solely Jeff, so there's no excuse on that. But for me, my main... My main um, my main reason for that not getting the best performance for me is literally doing things, getting the time management completely wrong. And I will line up to it. I've got the time completely wrong. So I knew I had to be fit for Jeff. So I trained extra hard, harder than any camp that I've trained for and picked and done it all way too early. Left it all in the gym. Yeah, no, I understand that. And, you know, people always like to speak as as they always do on social media and stuff like that. But to your credit, you were very honest in the post-fight interview. You made no excuses. And again, even now, no excuses are being made here. Um, I just think you spoke really well in that post-fight interview there. And, you know, no, no one can kind of not respect that. But tell me, moving forward, Arch, what do you want to do next? What is the plan now? Um, the plan is, like I say, is getting things right because at the end of the day, my eyes are still set on being a world champion. It's been that since day one. And I've got all the ability. The frustrating thing for me, Joe, is I've got all the ability in the world to beat any any fighter of super featherweight division. I still believe that to this day. I can beat any super featherweight to this day. However, I need to be Archie Sharp at 100%. I need to be on my A game. If I'm on my A game, I'll beat anyone in the super featherweight division. But at the minute, I've got my own battles now. So I've got to learn... Um, go back to drawing board and see how I can get the best Archie Sharp on fight night. That's all it is. It's a bit of tweaking, a bit of fine-tuning. Um, and, yeah, I'll be looking at these big fights. But for for the minute, I just need to get a few little bits sorted in camp. 
And um, so I'll go again. But yeah, 100%. I'm still number four in the WBO World Ranking. I'm only 25. I'm 19 and 0. So I'm standing in a very, very strong position at the minute. Um, and I've got eight months out of the way now. December was the last time I boxed. And even then, in December, when I boxed Ramla, as, as you know, I was very, very ill then. I wasn't ill this time, so there's no, no excuse. However, there's things that need to be changed, and they will be. So the next time I'm back in the ring, there'll be a very different Archie Sharp. But my goals on the Shaku Stevenson fights, the Carl Framptons, the, the Jamel Herring, Oscar Valdez, they all still remain the same. It's just maybe I need to just, like I said, I just need to get my little bits sorted before I jump up there. Because when I jump up there, Joe, you know me, when I took the Woodstock fight, it was about timing. And it's all about timing again. I believe in that very, very, so much, uh, very, very much. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. And, um, you know, you, you sound, even the way you're saying it, you sound like you've really matured as a fighter. Since, like, the, the first ever interview we did, you know, it's been a pleasure to watch you mature. And even now, you know, you're, you're almost talking like an old man with loads of experience, even though you're still young. You know, I think sometimes people forget, sometimes people get ahead of themselves. But, um, you know, bumps in the road like this mature you as a fighter. And it wasn't even that much of a big bump, to be honest. You're still undefeated, and rightly so. You definitely didn't lose the fight. People saying that, you know, a, a drinking something or smoking something um yeah. before we wrap it up arch if you've got any closing words at all just to to the listeners before we let you go yeah just uh, everyone still stay tuned because like i say the, the the best archie shark is still yet to come i haven't even touched the surface yet uh, i think it's fair to say i think joe will admit uh, agree that woodstock fight yeah i was fit i was lively i was on the back foot but since then i've kind of stayed a bit stagnant i've got a big knockout against Dex and Gary, but there's a lot more to come, and it will be coming because now I'm putting things right. I'm making massive decisions in camp, um, so believe me, there's a lot more to come. And when it does come, the, these little hurdles here—it's not really much of a hurdle, but these little things here—I rather put right with whilst I'm winning. I don't want to put things right by picking losses up. So I'm all, all the time I'm winning, I'm changing, and you will see the best up to shut very, very soon. And on Twitter, it's at ArchieSharp95. Yes, correct. Yes, the one. On Instagram? Archie, just type in ArchieSharp. Yeah, on Instagram, that's it. It'll come up if you search that in. Right, there we go. Listen, Archie, it's always a pleasure speaking with you, my friend. Like I say, you got the win. Um, it's not it's not important every time how you win. It's just that you win. You did that, so don't be too hard on yourself. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to the next time we chat. God bless. Thank you very much, Joe. I appreciate that. Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. Uh, the show is pretty much like it used to be. Obviously, through the lockdown, we've kind of had one guest on rather than two, and it's all been a bit jumbo-mumbo. Uh, it's back to normal with the review part, the guest, the pre... Uh, you know, the, the, the news, what I'm about to do, then the preview part, then another guest it'll end on. Um, we will be speaking later on in the show to Brandon Figueroa, the reigning WBA Super Bantamweight World Champion. He's in a tough fight late September. Um, so that makes it 20 world champions we've had on the show in 20 weeks running. Um, let me just... Let me just quickly give you a little list, Barry, of, of the guys that we've had on over the last sort of 20 weeks. I'll fly through this list, but some names from yes from the yesteryear, you know, that you'll go, oh, I think. Yep. So it I'm starts ready. with Lou Deval. We had him on. Um, obviously, oh. you know, trainer to, to Badu Jack and um, yep. light heavyweight champion. The, the week after we had Jamel Herring on, he's been on tons of times. Week after that, Bones Adams, Clarence Bones Adams we had on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was good. Week after that, Randy Caballero, who's disappeared from boxing. He now owns a barbershop. <laughs> He's talking about a comeback. The, wow. week, <laughs> the week after that, uh, Johnny Nelson. It was good to speak with him. The week after that, Junior Witter. Then uh, Andrew Maloney, who, of course, just recently lost to Joshua Franco on a top-ranked card. Um, the first world title show during the, the pandemic he, he was involved in. Uh, after that, Raul Marquez. After that, Bronco McCart. I really enjoyed that one. After wow, that, wow, yeah. Nate Campbell. Then Kermit Cintron. Then Tony Lopez. Then um, Carlos. Oh, Tony Lopez, the Tiger. Yeah, yeah. Wow. He gave me about an hour and a half. It was a proper conversation. Oh, um, fantastic. Carlos Hernandez. Then, um, then Kevin Kelly. Then Jesse James Leha. 
then Montel Griffin, <laughs> then um, Paul Butler wow. a couple of weeks ago, then David Benavidez, then last week Danny Roman, and this week um, Brandon Figueroa, like I say. So some names there, Barry. It's been hard. <laughs> yeah, unbelievable. So some of them, some of them are... Well, some of them were boxing before me, even. Unbelievable. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. It's fantastic. This. Yeah. Do you want to find them, to be fair, mate? Yeah, it's been. You, it's been, you do all the dig them out, yeah. It's been hard. I'm trying to set up a couple more, but we shall see how they pan out. But anyway, let's get into it. The, uh, the news part of the show, just a couple things to mention here. Um, not too much has really happened. Um, Jamel Herring, for the third time now, has announced he's going to be boxing Jonathan Aquendo. That's going to take place September 5th. It's been put off twice because Jamel's tested positive for coronavirus. Hopefully, third time lucky, he'll be okay. September 5th, so not too long to wait for that one. Uh, the MTK Golden Contract Final has been announced for the, um, for the super lightweight uh, division, I believe. Uh, sorry, I'm getting that wrong. Sorry, the finals for the super lightweight division and the featherweight division. We'll get to see at super lightweight, of course, O'Hara Davies and Tyrone McKenna and um, Ryan Walsh against Jazza Dickens. So that's going to take place or unfold on September 30th at the York Hall. Also, MTK Global have announced the uh, the semi-finals for their light heavyweight golden contract tournament. We're going to get to see... Um, I've got this wrong, I think, Barry. Have they drawn the... the uh, have they drawn no, it yet? No, yeah. No, I, I, I don't know if they've drawn the semi-final, but it's, it's, it's going on. I said the 26th of September in Latvia. Yes. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. 26th yeah. of September in Latvia, it says. Yeah, I think that's right, yeah. Yeah. Mm. I think got, I think that's sure, I'm not sure if the two semi-finals are going, to be, are going to be there, but it looks as if that's going to be the case. And I don't think... I'm not sure if they have drawn who's going to fight who yet. Well, the usually no, they haven't because they do it on the week of the fight. They they do it like they do it the day before the weigh-in. Yeah, they have the live draw, and then, yeah, so you don't so you don't really know who you're fighting. That's the whole that's the whole magic of it. You can't really train for anybody specific. You have to just you know ready pretty much. Okay. Well, yeah, those those events set to take place as you mentioned in uh, in, in in Latvia September 26th and in York Hall September 30th. So we'll keep our eyes peeled on that. Moving on to the preview part of the show. Boy, oh boy, he makes his ring return, Barry, after six years of retirement. We've seen him. You know who I'm talking about? I don't. Let me know. Okay, so we last saw him in a ring with Miguel Cotto when his knees were giving him serious issues. Sergio Martinez is back. Oh, no. I thought it was a joke. No, he's back this Friday, tomorrow. Oh, what's the matter with him? 51 and 3 with two draws. He returns in a 10 rounder in Spain um, against Jose Miguel Fandino, who's 15 and 6. Um, they're probably sort of giving us the best of Spain on the undercard, really, aside from Carmen Lejaraga. He's not on the card, but we get to see Sergio Garcia back out again. Not sure if he's still the European champion, but obviously, brilliant win over Ted Cheeseman when we last kind of seen him on TV over here. 31-0. Yeah. He takes on Pablo Mendoza, who's 9-4 and four over 10 rounds. Kiko Martinez, 40-9 and nine with two draws, is in an eight-rounder against Noe Regoza, who's 23-10 and 10 with two draws. Um... And former world title challenger, I think he boxed Charlie Edwards, Angel Marino, 20 and 4 with two draws in a six rounder against Ricardo Martinez, 7 and 2. Moving out now to Germany, another guy that's come back from retirement, Barry. Um, he was a brilliant fighter, by the way, um, at Cruiserweight. I, I bet you don't know who this, this is either. Is it Hernandez? Yeah, Juan Pablo Hernandez. Is it? Six no. years retired. He's back now at heavyweight, and he comes back against. <laughs> <laughs> he comes back against Kevin Kingpin Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a ten rounds then. <laughs> eight rounds, eight rounds. We, we're probably no, that's still that's... late there, yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> He's a good fighter. Hernandez was, was beautiful to watch when he was throwing. Yeah, it really was. It's just a shame it all. I think it was back problems or something that kept him out. He, yes, he, he right, yeah, I think you're right. Champion. Yeah, he retired as a champion, didn't he? Yeah. His final fight was against Fura Arslan in Germany. That might have even been a Box Nation card, actually. It was. It yeah. was. It was. So that's why. That's why I knew him so well because we had him on a few times. Those German shows for well, our life for a while. So yeah, I remember how beautiful he was. He, so, also, 
Yeah, he was good to watch because he also you thought if you could if he could if he catch one, he could go. You know, he had that look about him. So yeah, I think that's what made him sort of good to watch. But he was yeah, beautiful. Like, like all like all Cubans, beautifully skillful to watch. Absolutely fantastic. Yeah, but coming back, it's, you know, the problem is coming back with all these fighters. You just tend to think it's a little bit of ego, but mainly money, and that's that's always the worry. Then you're just fighting for the wrong things. Yeah, well, like I say, it'd be interesting to see. How he how he comes back twenty nine and one Kevin Kingpin Johnson thirty four and seventeen with a draw. Um, moving out to Russia, just one card to fly through. Um, Fedor Chudinov twenty two and two takes on Ronnie Ledata, who's seventeen and two. But the main event, Ruslan Fafer, he's um, who did he lose to? I'm sure we might have seen him. Was it in a world? He lost to 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 Biti to Biti over in the. I was there. I worked it actually in uh, is in in Ekaterinburg in Russia. Yeah, it was it was the it was the World Boxing Super Series. Yeah, it was a quarter final that way. Yeah, it? I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. So he's yeah. back against Alexei Papin, who um, is eleven and one. Okay, he's coming yeah. off that loss to Makabu for the world title, you know. So uh, yeah, and he gave a good show in there. He, I, I like Papin. I, I I was actually I was actually in Russia to see that fight as well. I was on the card with Yad and Kovalev. Yeah, uh, the Makubu, um, yeah, you're right, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a regular in Russia, you know. <laughs> but no, that's uh, that's a brilliant fight there. Kind of gone under the radar a little bit in Russia. Yeah. Um, brilliant main event there. Uh, moving out now to the Matchroom Fight Camp. Um, there's, I believe, five cards in total. Uh, five fights in total on the card. We get to see Alan the Savage Babich against Sean Del Winters. Um, you know, a bit of a late replacement Winters, 13 and 3. Tough if nothing else. I think he's up in age. I think he's in his early 40s. But, you know, he, he took a complete shellacking from Joseph Parker. I think it took him about 11 rounds or something to get him out of there. Um, he just keeps coming forward. Very, very fit guy. I, I hope I'm not fabricating this, but I think he might have been in the military or something. So he's a tough guy through and through. Um, but yeah, anyway, that'd be interesting. Alan, Alan Babbage, I think 3-0 and with three KOs. Obviously, the uh, the Dillian White protege. Also on the bill, brilliant, brilliant fight. This one, we've been waiting for a while for it, Barry. I wasn't even sure it would actually take place. Lufa Clay, 13-1 and against Chris Congo. Congo's the favourite with the bookies. That one's for... I'm not even going to mention the oh god the WBO global welterweight title. Let's forget that straight away. <laughs> Luther Clay and Congo Barry, talk to me about that. It's good. It's a good fight. It's a good fight, and I, I, and then this has. It's, it's had, I think these, these sort of fights are what I thought that you know, these lockdown shows were going to be all about. Fighters who are not going to demand the fortune for real competitive fights. Kids who are willing to go in the other person's backyard. But no, they sort they sort him. I know one of them was a, a matchroom fight as such, but they sort of meet on neutral ground, if you like. And it's a it, it's a fight that elevates either one. It really is, and it is a hazard. But I guess Luther K, Luther Clay maybe keeps your shape a little bit better, maybe so you edge him for that. But yeah, I I find it's hard to pick a winner. There are a lot of similarities in what they do. I feel, and but yeah. Yeah, it's going to be. A, I think it might. It won't steal the. It won't steal the show because the, the, you know, the top of the bill and, and the and the chief support are, are, are pretty good fights on paper. But yeah, I think on the other on the other all the other shows we've, we've seen on both channels, this this that fight might maybe would have stolen the limelight. No, brilliant, brilliant fight. Thoroughly looking forward to it. Also, another brilliant fight that was added quite late. Uh, Jack Cullen, eighteen and two against Zach Chelly, seven and one. Um, over ten Good rounds, fight. of course. Chelly was sort of a guy that I was really high on. Um, you know, he he obviously beat Umar Sadiq at the Brentwood Centre. I was there for that one. Um, I've just really liked him. Sort of, I remember him boxing. Um, um, what's his name? That the journeyman. I think his name's. Yeah, Adam Jones was a journeyman. Tough, tough guy. Oh, yeah, he's and, t- yeah, yeah, tough. Yeah, and he wobbled tough. him to his boots, and I thought, wow, he's got serious power. It's, it's real because Jones never been stopped. Yeah, and um, yeah, I don't think he. I don't think he has though. I, I, I think for me, Chelly, I think he's on whack because he's explosive. He throws everything to every shot. He doesn't box like Eubank Junior. But he reminds me of Eubank Junior. In when you watch him at a lower level, you go like with Eubank Junior when he first came on the scene. He looked like the biggest punch you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> He's battling off combinations. You go, whoa! It's only the punches are keeping this guy up. Do you know what I mean? It was like that sort of thing. Like 
But then when you see him against world class operators, you go, well, it looks every punch he throws looks like it should, should punch a hole through the wall, but it's not. Do you know what I mean? And I think I think Cherry got a little bit of that with him. He, he puts everything into every shot, and he looks like he can punch holes through walls. He just because he puts so much snap in the shots, they are hurting. It will knock you out. But no, but I mean, he's not a bigger puncher as even as his first may seem. I think you'll see that as he as he steps up in level. So and my worry about my worry about Cherry is that he runs out of steam. Listen, Cullen's tall and thin. You, te- you tend to think he can be hurt, but if Cherry goes chasing him too hard too soon, he will run out of steam and get beat up. I no, he has to be a little bit cleverer than he's been in the past. I think tactically, he hasn't been great, Shelley. He's been, he looked really good, and he, and again, he's exciting to watch, and you want to see him fight this one. He'll make this fight a good fight, and it will be a good fight, and it'll be all because of Zach Shelley doing. But he has to be careful because Cullen, you know, he's tall, and he, but he looks like he's he's made a paper, but he's not. He's a tough kid, you no, know, who, who who can take a shot to give a shot, and he, and he uses that reach, you no. Know, when he's when he's when he's engaged his brain to to its maximum. Yeah, and like I say, I I, I like the fight. Um, I I you know I remember watching Chelly you know drop Cody Davies. Then he lost to Davies fair and square. And then of course Davies went on to box Umar Sadiq, who Chelly beat, and then he loses to Sadiq. So there's there's a good uh, trio, yeah. and we, we're going to kind of add Jack Cullen to that mix. There it seems. Um, Great fight. Uh, getting on to the women's fight again. This one for the WBC, WBA, IBF, and WBO female lightweight titles. The rematch uh, that was on the the uh, the undercard of Joshua Ruiz one in in the states. Katie Taylor fifteen and zero. Delphine Pursuin forty four and two. Um, I thought Pursuin won the first one, Barry, but I favour Taylor massively in the second one for a, a couple reasons. Really, uh, the, the first one being obviously. She tried to go in the Olympics, didn't she? And she lost over three rounds to someone I don't think was that special. Yeah. Which can happen, you know, it's it's a totally different sport. But um, I've heard that she's... I heard she had pneumonia earlier this year or, or something like that, and she was recovering. And I also am guessing if she's still working as a policewoman, she's probably been real busy during this lockdown. <laughs> that's my yeah, That's my analogy. <laughs> Yeah, and it can all have an effect, of course. I think that, yeah, first of all, the, the, the Olympic thing, the way Pursuit fights with no real thought of our work, the only thought is, I'm going to walk right through you behind my punches. So, you know, you can see her being on boxing in the amateurs, three rounds. You can see that quite comfortable, to be fair, because anyone can move, because you can move. As Katie said, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have been a competitive fight in the amateurs, her and Katie Taylor. Over the longer distance, though, it, it's, a, it's a different, it, as we've seen, it's a different setup. And but I, I'm the same as you. I thought Pursuit just did enough to. St- I didn't think it was a robbery. To be fair, I thought she, she just did enough to get over the line in the first fight. And I, I favour Katie Taylor massive in the sec in this fight if she engages her brain. But all I'll go, go quick with this. Taylor reminds me of Joe Carzaghi in, in a lot of his his title ring where he never really uses boxing brain. It's, nor does she. And they both have fantastic boxing brains. But what they do. Is they both fit, they were both physically gifted, like Taylor is, and so and Joe certainly was, that they just go for the full repertoire of skills, and it's enough. So then they 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 stop thinking, they just go through the repertoire of skills every fight, and it always works. For them. The same routine she does, that little step back and make you fall short and counter. It didn't work against Pursuit, or it nearly never worked, but you know she was getting caught. So I think she uses her brain again, and that's and you have to we, we teach yourself how to do that. She does that. And she starts spinning off at angles closer to the body and pursuing that's a chaser. And you make bassoon think where she doesn't think, that will tire her out. Thinking and having to move your body in different ways really drains your energy. And if pursuing has to do that, then I think Taylor can put on a bit of a masterclass. But if she can't and she's close to the same routines as last time, she might still get over the line, but it will be another grueling, you know, real torrid affair. Which I hope it is, because I, I want to see the same fight as we've seen the first time, because it was great to watch. So I, I don't have no, I have no horse in the race. So I want to see that. I want to see that dog fight again, because it was fantastic to watch. Really good, really good TV. And, and you know, first fans, we hope Taylor leaves her brain at home. But for for any Taylor fans and for Taylor's camp, then she has to use that brain, use the angles, and make pursuing keep her and make her think, and she'll panic and she'll run out of steam. 
really that's my take to it. Um, I, I, I've, I've, I've strongly got I'm, oh, my prediction is strongly um, Katie Taylor to win on points so I think uh, in that one uh, and then yeah. the main event Barry Dillian White 27-1 and one against Alexander Povetkin 35-2 and two with a draw it's for the obviously uh, Dillian White's interim WBC title and the vacant WBC diamond belt which I know you're going to love <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, it's, it's a brilliant fight Barry um, you know the, the fact that it's taking place in Eddie's back garden as well is, is, is excellent you know we're not really it's the first real kind of super fight if we're being honest um, I know, I know, it's not for a genuine world title, but in my eyes, anyway, it's it's the it's the best fight we've seen. Two big names, heavyweight division, so much on the line, especially for Dillian White. I'm a huge fan of this fight. I think it's very risky. It's another it's another one of about seven risky fights Dillian's had in a row now, yeah. and um, I've got to give him so much credit for taking it. Michael Hunter thinks that Povetkin's going to win. I think Dillian White on points. How do you see it? I think Dillian White. I, I, I don't think Povetkin has the same legs as he had the, as he had when he boxed Joshua. Even even then, he was slowing down. I, 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 he's a good fighter. He, he has a small. He's not the tallest, but he uses that that lack of height to his advantage. He dips to his left, and that's where he gets the power from because he, he engages the legs and when he jumps into that left hook. And sometimes he'll dip to the same side, but he'll throw that right hand over the top. So he, he has you thinking all the time. He slips inside punches quite confidently and puts you under pressure with the front foot. There's lots of things he does right. But if, if Dillian can keep, can keep moving to his right, away from, away from me, away from, you, can, you can block that. You can block that left hook and fire back. Just keep away from that right hand because Dillian drops his left hand quite low quite often, as most heavyweights do in this, in this era. Then I think, and, he, and if he starts at a high pace, but he's disciplined in his work as well. That's important, the discipline. Then I think I don't think Povetkin can stay with him. That's that's I think. But if Povetkin can be economical but effective, then Dillian will be the one who's who's, who's looking for a rest after an eight rounds. So uh, no, we've seen Dillian you know, in, in fights before. They sort of panic a little bit. But again, but I'm with you. I think he wins. And, and I would sort of favour points, but I wouldn't be shocked if he could, if he all of a sudden. You no, know, Povetkin went and jumped in with, a, with, a, with one of the left hooks to finish Dillian off, and Dillian you know, did a half a lean back with his left hook and casting on with his feet off the floor, and knocks him out. I could see that happening quite clearly. Mm-hmm. What Dillian will do if he hurts you, he will finish you. He goes all out. He, 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 he literally, I don't want to sound like Tundi Aj, but he empties the tank. He really, he really does. He commits himself to that to, to, to get you out there, and that's why the fans love to watch him because he's that sort of fight there then and, and he will be in trouble if he doesn't get you out there after that because he'll he have no energy there and again but it's another fight that he's going to have to take he could have sat home waiting for his world title shot you know I know he's getting he's getting massively compensated for it so let's not feel sorry for him at all but you know, the man's in millions already without having to get, uh, without having a sniff of a world title shot which is you know just an unbelievable position to be in but you know once you've earned that money you, you're in it for the glory aren't you and, he, and to be fair like I don't know Dillian well, but I've known him since you know, since since his his, his first um, problem he had with with a prescription drug or a, a drug over the counter. Was a real that was a real misunderstanding the first time he had a problem with with drug tests in in, in Britain when he got banned for something he bought in Holland and Ballot or something silly like that. It was at the time, to be fair, to his credit. But um, he he lo- he wants to be a champion. He loves to fight. He loves to fight. You can see it in him. You know, it, a lot of people say it and don't mean it, but he does. He loves to scrap, which is some, which could be his undoing at times. But I, and, in this fight, I don't think so. I think he's got Pavecki. It's a risky fight, but I think he's got Pavecki at the right time. And um, I think it'll just, it'll just help him cement his, his, his stature and his position now for, for getting his deserved mandatory shot. Which I know I moaned and groaned about at the beginning of the show, but he still deserves it. No, he but he deserved is. it. A year, he deserved it a year ago with the round mind. So you know, yeah, but it'll be it'll be a good scrap. And I think it's a, I think it's a, as a, I think it's a good build all the way from top to bottom. I'll be honest. Yeah, it is. 
But, um, yeah, no, definitely looking forward to it. So many different kind of things you can pick at. Is he getting Povetkin at the right time? Is Povetkin getting Dillian at the right time in terms that, you know, he, he didn't look in great shape in Saudi. He's 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 trained like a like a war horse in Portugal. He's been locked away. He's, he's with a new trainer now in Xavier Miller, who not a lot of people know. I know him quite well, actually. I've known him from before. He, he, he trained Dillian, but... There's there's a lot of changes in Dillian's camp, if you like, and body physique and everything by the looks of things. So very, very interesting fight. I can't downplay it in any way. Moving out now to the production studio. Just going to fly through these in Redditch here. Channel 5 on Saturday. Um, good to see Mick Hennessy back on Channel 5. Top in the bill, Shakam Pitters, 13-0 and against Chad Sugden, uh, who is 11-1 and with a draw. That draw, of course, came... Um, in his last fight, December last year against Craig Richards, a real a real uh, strange performance from Richards. That one there for the British light heavyweight title. A return to the ring for Isaac Chamberlain, ten and one, going in against Anthony Woolery. It's almost two years since Chamberlain's been in the ring. Anthony Woolery, two and two. Um, yeah, not going to offer much really for 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 Isaac Chamberlain. Uh, Mick Hennessy Jr. also on the card, three and zero with a draw. He takes on Tom Brennan, who's one and one. Uh, moving out now to the bubble in the MGM Grand Las Vegas. Um, on the undercard, we get to see Rob Brandt, former world champion, 25-2. and two. He's in a 10-rounder against Vitaly Kopelenko, who's 28-2. and two. Top of the bill, though. Fun fight. Um, Going to probably have to talk about this for a minute here, Barry. Alida Alvarez, 25-1, and one, former world champion. This is definitely not going the distance. I don't think, anyway. Against Joe Smith Jr. I really like Joe <laughs> Smith Jr. He can punch like yeah. a mule kicks. 12 rounds. Does it go 12, Barry? I'm not quite sure. I don't think I do. I don't think so. I, I think it's out of the fight to lose. I think Smith's not the hardest tag of the fight, of course, but you know, but they both got good wins. Obviously, you know, Smith beat Bernard Hopkins, didn't he, a while back? And and then, and obviously Alvarez beating Kovalev, of course, but uh, obviously, you know, Kovalev got his revenge. But yeah, it's a, it's a it's a good little fight. It's a fun fight, isn't it? That's what, and that's what again. With the lack of crowd, lack of atmosphere, you need, these sort of fights where they they won't they won't matter after a couple of rounds where they are. These two will end up going for each other. Alvarez will think because Smith in the easy tag of the hit that he can knock him out and he'll go for it. Uh, and I, and I think and I think he, he'll oblige throwing back himself there. So yes, it's a cracking little fight. I've got to say you missed out the bill this Sunday afternoon on IFL TV. There's the MTK got a live show from Kazakhstan. Tell me about it. Sorry, you probably didn't, you probably didn't know about. Well, well, there's a load of Kazakh fights. I couldn't even put. I'll be, I'll be doing the comms with Alex Demon, but I can't pronounce their names. Oh. It's going to take me four or five days to, to to get their names right, and I'll get them all wrong all Sunday afternoon. So, yeah, watch your IFL and just criticise me on my pronunciation of, of all these uh, all these fighters. Yeah, there's, there's some good. There's some good. There's, if you have a look, there's some good fighters on the bill. Some, they they be on boxing kids who are like five and one and, and four and zero oh and things like that. So it's a uh, they don't mess around over there because they have such amateur experience. They just chuck them in straight away. It's literally like sink or swim. They don't care. They're ruthless in places like that. You know, you're either good or you're not good. If you're good, prove it. Well, we've seen it with, with the guys who have won medals in the Olympics and World Championships who, who fought boxing for world titles in their fourth, fifth, sixth, tenth fight. So, you know, they do it. They do that all the way through the boards. It, it's it's really good. So it should be it should be a good night, hopefully, a good afternoon. So it's a Sunday afternoon of boxing to to um, complement all the other big shows we've got us around in it. So yeah, boxing is everywhere at the minute. You can't you can't turn on the TV without seeing boxing. Yeah, this this weekend full of it. Yeah. Now I'm really looking forward to that um, Alvarez Smith uh, fight. Smith's almost like our. He's like the American. I, I don't want to disrespect. Um, Callum Johnson, but I, I see them guys as like who needs them, you know? Like they they both punch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Johnson's obviously got way more pedigree. But moving on, I just like the story for Joe Smith Jr. I think he was like a builder or something. He turned to boxing and you know, yes, he, Bernard, right, he knocked him out the ring. Bernard landed on his head and then said his ankle was hurt. But we will leave that there. Um, next Wednesday, <laughs> next Wednesday, just going to quickly. Um, uh, preview this because by the time we record the show next week the, the fight would have took place but okay, yeah. a, a, a fight that takes place at, at the Queensland Ca- Country Bank Stadium Tim Tzu son of you know who takes on Jeff Horn over yeah. 10 rounds 
Interesting fight that. Um, Tim Tazu is a big favourite, which I was quite surprised to see. Um, you know, I, I haven't seen much of him. I know he's supposed to be real good, but um, Jeff Horn, I, I don't know. Just yeah, that's not going to be easy. Jeff Horn is, is, is a tough well, guy, you know. Well, Jeff Horn's one of those fighters. If you when you watch him, you you would go, I could beat him. Yeah. Because he does nothing. He does nothing great. There's nothing great. Nothing that you go. That's he's a bit like Cooker me. He punch me like me. Gary Corcoran. Yeah, but you're a bit like me. I, yeah, yes, yeah, of course he is. You think, oh, no, he don't look strong. Don't look like he hits that hard. Don't look like he boxes that good. But, but he's, just, he's just extremely hard to beat. He's, he's one of those. Don't look great. He doesn't look great. Well, look, he beat Pacquiao, for God's sake. You know what I mean? And he so did. I, and I, I thought he did. beat him. Yeah. I think he did. It was close, but I thought he did enough. You know, I thought he was just busy, busy, busy. He's tenacious. He takes a good shot, and he's willing to work, and he puts the work in. I don't know how good this. I haven't haven't seen Tim Zoo to my you know, embarrassment. I should have really had a look at him, but I haven't seen him. But and the other thing is, is this a middleweight now? Maybe or maybe that's mate where Horn maybe you know they might be edging their best. He's not a natural middleweight. He's, this is one fifty four. Oh. This one. Oh, so it's right middle. Oh, so yeah, so Horn. No, no, that's Horn. Be fine right now. That's that's a risky fight. They must really fancy Zoo. Really fancy him. Yeah. Uh, Listen, if, if he's ten percent, if he's ten percent as good as his dad, then then he's no. He's already one of the best in the world. Let's be honest, because <laughs> because his Costa was just unbelievable, but yeah. unbelievable. But Tim Tzu, fifteen and zero, the winner of the fight takes home the IBF Australasian Super Welterweight title. And who okay. cares? I won't. I won't. Oh, we we got to include the WBO Global mm. title as well. And uh, the final card oh, to mention. Mate. It's an it's, it's an MTK uh, Global show midweek, isn't it? Next week, Barry. Yeah, another one. Production another one. Production Park they're, 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 Studios. Um, it is. I've been, I've been, I've been Wakefield. Yeah, so it's a really. Do you know that that studio is amazing because it, well, they, it's a big. Like, it looks like an aircraft hangar, and what they use it for. Like, there's no boxing related. Really. So what they use it for is, if say Robbie Williams is performing in Wembley, they'll put they'll build the real stage there, and they rehearse. It's fantastic. Really good idea. So they rehearse like a live thing on a proper stage, not like just rehearsing in a room. So they know how far away they got. The, they can do, if they have like a dance routine or whatever, they can do all the steps and all that, and they, and they use it for that. Then they take the stage and put it in the arena or the stadium where it actually will be. And that's what they're using. And the, the good thing about it as well, it's the changing rooms are in the hall, so you could be bad. It's really dark in there, but you could be getting bandaged up watching the fights. And it's just like being in an amateur comp. When you go in the amateur competitions, but like, like you know, real high level international competitions, it's like that. You're always getting changed watching the fights. It's a real team sort of atmosphere. So, for the ones who are good amateurs, it's it's, it's easier for them because they'll just go back into that mode straight away. For the ones who weren't or have been pro for a long time, it's it's a bit more difficult situation to get used to. But yeah, good good card and an interesting location there. Um... Lee McGregor eight and zero takes on Ryan Walker eleven and one over ten. Uh, Darren Tetley twenty and zero in a ten rounder against Liam Taylor twenty one and one with a draw. Uh, Gary Cully ten and zero takes on Craig Woodruff who is ten and five over eight. And the main event, if I'm not mistaken, Lewis Crocker eleven and zero for the vacant WBO European title um, at welterweight against Louis Green who's twelve and one. That's the thing. I'm just going to finish on this, Barry. The uh, you know the thing with with MTK is they. I'm not just saying this. I've got no reason to just say this, but they match their fighters tough. You know that they, they they bring us fifty fifty fights a hell of a lot of the time. Well, they they never used to. So literally, when I first started, I gotta be honest, they never used to because they, you just go through, you pick a a, a, a formula and a, and a system that's been working for others. You you feed them easy fights, learn their fights, and you chuck them into a title sort of thing. And let's change the whole. I think the whole. Um, Concept of boxing has changed anyway. I think you know, for me, the climate of boxing has changed anyway over the years. But with the influx of Eastern European fighters fast tracking themselves, so other fighters in fact want to do that and promoters have had to do that. So you can't build up a, 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 a George Collins now, 34, 35, and 0 anymore. It's impossible to do that. But they, in, in sort of the last sort of two years, they've upped their game, MTK. They really have compared, and, and this lockdown, they really. Because they've got so many fighters, and the, they've signed so many fighters now. They're the biggest management company in, in the world for boxing. So they fight and they're putting their fighters against each other. Where before they tried to avoid that, but now they've had to do it. And I think, and also these kids want to fight. That's a minute. These kids can turn down fights. 
to be honest, I don't, I don't know what else they're going to do, but you know, they, they don't have to fight each other. But they, I think people are realizing now, and it's going back to like the eighties a little bit, where a loss doesn't change your career; it's how you lose and how you win sometimes as well, or more importantly. But a loss doesn't, you know, put put the nail in the coffin of your career. Uh, nowhere near that, because you end up what you end up doing is quite often in a good fight. He's talking about the loser, how well he did, how competitive he was, how brave he was, and so on and so forth. You sometimes forget, oh, hang on, let's mention the winner here now, the kid who actually won the fight. Because you, cause you think you des- he deserves respect even though he didn't get the win. He deserves, it's not just like a, a run-of-the-mill win for the, for the guy. The other guy had to work hard and he made it close. And the last MTK show I did was really good. You know, we had Meredith Thomas you know, versus Iqbal. It was a really, you know, two kids there who could have avoided each other. Two nightmares, the box, one six foot one, one six foot welterweight. And they were willing to get in with each other, and, and you know, and, and it was a really good fight to watch. John O'Connell, willing, John 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 O'Connell, willing to fight uh, Maxi Hughes. You no, know, again, the Who Needs Him Club, by the way. You, you mentioned that earlier. He's he's he's, a, he's almost a president of it in the UK, and 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 he and and, and it backfired on him, of course. He lost. But I thought it was close, but I had Carroll winning by a round. But but you no, know, I didn't argue. I'm, I'm happy for Maxi Hughes. So yeah, I think you know these competitive fights. It only you know, a competitive fight for these young kids. Every time they fight, it's no good. If you don't learn anything. You just have you're learning just to be tough and have the to dig it out. But learning fights like and no every every other fight having a proper competitive fight just get them ready for title shots. Get them ready for real when they get when they step up to that level. And it's very that's very important. It's not about winning a title. It's about keeping it where you make your money. So you want your fighter to be ready. And by ready, means he has to be used to fighting against people who come to win. And that's why MTK are building right now. So yeah, all credit to him. Yeah, all credit to MTK. And that is it. We've we've brought you the review part. We brought you the first guest. We've done the news, the preview part. The second guest will be coming on in just a few seconds. Just before we wrap it up, Barry, if you want to just close out with some final words, I really appreciate you, you know, coming on. It's been a long, long time. Speaking with you is is always a complete pleasure, and I really mean that. And I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for uh, for, for doing this again with me. It's been a complete pleasure. Oh, Joe, we go back so long now. Joe, I think I had hair the first time. I, I didn't have hair the first time I met you, but it feels like I had hair. Do you know what I mean? It's been a long time now. I, I had my own teeth when I met you. That's how long ago that was. And I spoke so much because I might not speak to you now for another six, six to eight months. So I, got, I, I made this podcast go on an extra 45 minutes longer than it normally would. And that makes me happy. <laughs> All right, excellent. Barry, thank you very much. (laughs) The final thing to do is to welcome our second guest on this week's show. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the reigning WBA Super Bantamweight World Champion and our third rated best young fighter under the age of 25 throughout the year of 2019. It is, of course, Mr. Brandon Figueroa. Brandon, welcome back on the show, my friend. No, thank thank you for having me again. Always a pleasure, Brandon. For real. Um, so so, Brandon, we last spoke in in the last week of October last year. Obviously, at that point, you were set to defend your title about three weeks from then against Julio Seja. Just for the UK listeners, tell us what actually happened there, because obviously, you know, the fight ends in a split draw. Of course, there was there was craziness about the weight of of, of Seja. Just give us a real quick rundown. I know it's in the past now. No, yes, of, of course. You know, I went toward that fight with uh, two elbow injuries and a hand injury. Um, I knew he was going to be a tough opponent. <clears throat> um, I didn't really expect him uh, to come over eight, to be honest. I mean, I knew that even though with my injuries, I still had the upper hand. But obviously, uh, with him being over eight, overweight, uh, he had the, you know, the advantage on me. So, um, despite that being happened, you know, it was my first time fighting on, on Las Vegas, fighting in a big, big under, uh, undercard like that or a car like that under Wilder and Ortiz. So, you know, the expectations were high. It was one of my biggest opportunities to, to shine, and I took it, you know. I know uh, the fight, I think the Coleman event <clears throat> or the one be- before the Coleman event was the Luis Neri fight, and he came overweight by one pound, and his opponent didn't take it. And I took the fight knowing that my opponent was four pounds heavier than me, and knowing that you know he he, he came with the he, he that knowing that he can win. So with that being said, you know uh, me and my team said yeah we agreed to the fight. We prepared well enough, you know uh, even though we didn't expect him to become over to be overweight, but we took the challenge. It was a tough fight. 
um, I feel like despite my injury, I still feel like I did enough to win. And not even at my worst did he even beat me. But, you know, I know if I would have given the rematch, I would probably now would probably get him out of there in three rounds. But, uh, you know, it was, it was a good learning experience. He came to fight. I say that he didn't really come come to win because if he did it, if he really came to win, he would have made weight so that he can get the belt. I just felt like he just wanted to make a statement. And, I mean, four pounds overweight, four and a half pounds overweight is inexcusable, you know, especially at a championship-level fight. And not only that, but he has been in championship-level fights. So he should already know that he's supposed to meet uh, the, the, the weight mark. But, you know... Uh, my team, we never, we never back down from any fight. We see every fight as a learning experience. And, yeah, we definitely learn from this fight. Yeah, and as you say there, yeah, four and a half pounds over the weight. So not only did he not make 22, uh, 122, the, the super bantamweight limit, he was over the, tw- the the featherweight limit, 126, which is bizarre. He was two weight classes above you, yeah. if you like, at the weigh-in. God knows what he weighed on the actual fight night. Um you know, you mentioned yes, sir, yeah. you mentioned there, Brandon, that you were you were given the option to not take the fight, but you went with it. Do you regret taking it now? No, 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 no. You know, I see it as a learning experience, and like I said, you know, he he, he couldn't even beat me at my worst, and that's because he's a you know top contender. I mean, that just lets you know how tough I am. That lets you know that you know I I belong there in in the ring, and not only that, but I mean, I I, I took his punches. And he didn't hurt me not once. I mean, it, it was a close fight. I, I give him credit. Um, you know, he 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 did he did uh, land a lot of punches on me. Um, you know, I liked a lot of uh, you know a lot of work. But you know, despite with the injuries, I felt like I did enough to to beat him. And I like I said, you know, I felt like whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And definitely, I felt like that's just gonna make me stronger in 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 every way, mentally, uh, physically. And just overall, as, as a fighter, I know a lot of people see it a different way. A lot of uh, people see it like one of my worst performing fights. But, I mean, if people were to understand what I went through my training camp, you know, only sparring once in, in my whole training camp, only hitting the back four rounds out of the whole training camp. When I'm used to, you know, sparring 10, 12 rounds and sparring maybe two, three times a week. But, you know, we we never say no to any fight. You know, that's one thing about our mentality. And I feel like my mentality is going to, take me more than than a lot of fighters that pick and choose their their fights i mean i know it's 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 uh you know it's being smart about it about your longevity but i mean i, I don't care man I, I just want to fight i like to get in there and rough it up i know as a, as a young fighter i still have a lot to learn and you know i'm, I'm barely 23 you know god knows uh what what he has in store for me when i'm 25 26 27 um but you know definitely i know i know i have what it takes to to become an elite fighter world-class fighter and I know my last fight wasn't the best performing fight, but, you know, I'm back now. No injuries. Uh, no, nothing to hold me back. And I feel amazing. I feel in the, in probably one of the best shapes in my life. And I feel like September 26th, I will showcase that. And I'm really excited for that. Um, I know that you obviously firmly feel that if, by the way, Seha had boiled down and lost the weight and made the weight you know he wouldn't have been as you know as tough on the night you you'd have won i know you believe that i believe i believe that too um let me ask you brandon obviously this lockdown and stuff what have you been up to during the quarantine what's kept you busy oh uh, you know i uh, thank god i have my own private gym um here in, in my city so yeah i mean obviously it has held back held back a lot of uh, my career opportunities for example i was supposed to fight may and they got pushed back down to to uh, September now. But, you know, uh, the way I see it is you, you, you got to take the good from the bad. And the way I see it is more more preparation time for me. You know, I've recovered from my injuries, um, uh, you know, the physical therapy and all that. And, you know, just resting and making sure that my body is well rested for my training camps. And I've been training since June. So definitely, you know, I've, I've been waiting. I've been hungry. I've been... You know, just waiting to to let these hands go and show everybody that you know nothing's gonna hold me back and that I belong in the, you know, uh, I know I came out in the ESPN top 25 under 25 uh, year old uh, rankings and you know I gotta prove not only to to people but to myself that you know I belong in that world class level. Yeah, you certainly do. And um, you mentioned there, you know, you, you're feeling in great shape. You've been training for a long time now. Have you been able to get good sparring in? Oh, yes, sir. Yeah, you know, that, there's a lot of uh, really good fighters here in the Valley where I'm from. And, uh, yeah, you know, I've been trying to stay safe. Uh, 
making sure I don't get COVID and, and all this stuff going on. But uh, I've been doing uh, the best to stay in shape and stay safe at the same time. And before I kind of get on to your fight that you mentioned you touched on September 26th, I, I've, I've always got to ask you this question. How's your brother Omar? Any news with him? What's what's next for him? Yeah, you know, he's definitely get, getting back to work. He's getting busy with it too. I know, uh, you know, he sees me grinding and I know he misses it as well. So, you know, yeah, I know he's, I think he said he wants to fight by 2021. Uh, right now, he's, he's just maintaining himself, staying consistent, staying busy. The same thing that I do is, you know, staying busy, staying ready so that I don't have to get ready when a fight is, is brought to me. So, yeah, you know, he's definitely getting ready. And, yeah, Team Fiero is uh, always ready to, to give a show and, and give a fans a, a great uh, boxing show, you know, get the fans what they want. Yeah, and we love watching you both fight. So your next fight has been announced, like you said. It will take place on this Charlo undercard, September 26th in Connecticut, live on Showtime pay-per-view. Uh, the whole card of, of boxing, by the way, is absolutely mouth-watering. It's a brilliant card. Obviously, you'll be defending your yeah. title against Damian Vasquez, who boasts a record of 15-1 and one, um, with, with one draw. Do you know much about Damian, Brandon? Uh, not really, you know. I know that he's a little slick boxer. Um, I know he doesn't really have power or anything like that. So we're gonna we're gonna take the fight to him. I know I'm the biggest, strong guy. Um, you know, I I've been sparring guys that are 160, 155 pounders. Wow. And you know, I put the pressure on them, and you know, I I, I, I do good. You know, I'm, I feel strong, physically, mentally, and everything that it takes to get them out of there in three, four rounds. You know, I know that I think he made a comment saying that. He was going go to go toe-to-toe with me, and, you know, I laughed because that's my game plan. You know, that's my game plan, and I feel like once he feels my power, he's gonna, he's not going to want to go toe-to-toe with me. I guarantee you that. Yeah, if, if you're listening, Damien, do not go toe-to-toe with Brandon. Even I, even I, <laughs> even I advise you that. Um, your 2019, Brandon, was, was the best year of your career, obviously, whereas um, Damien's 2019 was probably the worst of his career. That's where both uh, his loss and his draw happened. He lost unanimously over eight rounds to former world champion Juan Carlos Payano. No shame in that. A good fighter, Payano, um, who's also mm-hmm. on, the, on the undercard as well, uh, September 26th, against Daniel Roman. Um, and then, obviously, the draw with, with Josu uh, Morales over six rounds. Morales only had that record of nine and ten with three draws which does seem a bit odd but other than that um you know vasquez yeah. is a, he's a dangerous fight you know he's, he's in the top 15 with the wba he's better than you know if you have a look at his record you might think he's not so good he's actually a good fighter though yeah you know yeah yeah you know we're, we're not gonna discredit him from anything you know i've been training i've been training hard like if i'm going in there against you know one of the best fighters you know that's how i always prepare myself in, in these fights but uh yeah, you know, I know once once he he feels my power, just like any of my other opponents, opponents, they underestimate me. They underestimate because of of my physique or 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 my my pretty face. But I know once uh once I get in there, once I rough him up, once I hit him with that with those body shots, I know he's gonna he's gonna feel him. He's gonna feel him definitely. Especially now that you know I don't have any injuries to hold me back, and I feel like I've gotten even stronger than before. So um, I know just the moment of. Uh, just for him to 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 put my power, and I feel like I'm just gonna put the pressure on him and just keep throwing punches. The, you know, one of the best arsenal of of my pedigree is just throw a lot of punches, combinations, body shots. Uh, you know, punches from my angle, so you know I'm ready. I'm ready to get in there and mix it up. And like I say, we are very, very excited for that whole night. Um, just before we kind of wrap it up, Brandon, anything else going on at all? Any other interesting things going on before we let you go? Uh, no, sir, you know, just, just working right now, hard. you know, like I said, you know, uh, coronavirus has really just stopped everything in its tracks, you know. Um, I know once this fight is over, I'm gonna, I'm trying to build a gym here, probably one of the best gyms here in the Valley. Uh, uh, and not only that, but, you know, just invest my money and be smart with my money. <clears throat> I know that, you know, after this, hopefully after this fight, everything comes out good, I come out clean, I'm ready to fight again, you know. I've been hungry. I've been, you know, uh, we've been staying in contact with Mr. Ahaman, and he knows that, you know, I couldn't fight. He knows that I prefer myself at 100%. And, you know, I'm just 23. Like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm a young fighter. And I feel like, 
you know, I'm only going to get better from here. And just finally, Brandon, if you've got any closing message just to your UK supporters over here, like I say, lots and lots of people over here love seeing you fight. It's always all action with the Figueroas, but you're very exciting. <laughs> uh, what's, your, what's your message to your UK supporters? No, that I appreciate all of my fans, of course. I know you guys love seeing, you know, the, that Mexican style, that amazing, you know, fight. I know uh, a lot of people don't have that. A lot of people, I see a lot of fighters don't have just that, you know, where it's all action, all action packed, you know, punches from my angles, punches, uh, uh, you know, body shots, uppercuts, hooks, you know, you get everything. It's all in one. So I appreciate all my UK fans. I appreciate you for for this interview. I know that I've been busy here, uh, you know, trying to work everything out here at home with the coronavirus. Because I know here in the Valley, it was actually, it was actually, there's a bunch of cases. It, it got really bad here. But I think, God willing, it's under control. But yeah, you know, I'm ready to go. Tell my can fans, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to give you guys a show. And yeah, you know, let's get it. And thank you guys for watching. And hopefully you guys tune in to the, oh, it's actually going to be my first pay-per-view. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. And yeah, thank you. Thank you all to, to my fans. I appreciate you guys. Thank you. Well said, Brandon. Listen, it's always great to catch up with you, my friend. Thank you for your time. And I'll certainly be tuned in on September 26th in support. Yes, sir. Thank you. I appreciate it. Brandon Figueroa there. Um, I did say that we might have three or four interviews earlier on in the show. We've ended up with three in total. So here's our third and final guest, the new trainer of Dillian White, ahead of his fight with Alexander Povetkin in just over 48 hours' time, Mr. Xavier Miller. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the new trainer of Dillian White. It is, of course, Mr. Xavier Miller. Zav, welcome to the show, my man. Oh, thank you for, for having me, man. Absolutely, my pleasure, Zav. Good to speak to you. So tell us just, uh, or tell our listeners, I should say, just a little bit about you and obviously Dillian starting a working relationship because not many people will know this, but obviously at one stage you were part of Derek Chisora's camp for a long time. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, as soon as you, a, lot, a lot of it, it's a long, long story, but um, yeah, I've got a, a very close relationship with uh, with Don Charles. Um so I've always been in and around well-established fighters. Um, Don really looked after me. Um, he's been like a mentor. And he um, he prepared me to, to be at this level. So um, I, I owe a lot to him. Uh, he understands my story. Uh, he knows how I got started in boxing. And it's been a long, long journey. And, um, you know, we're here now. And of course, um, Dillian and and Mark Tibbs obviously they split while Dillian was was uh, you know locked down in Portugal. You then had to fly out there. What was the facility like out there? It's obviously not you know your usual surroundings. What was it like out there, Zev? No, that's not, that's not actually what happened. Oh, okay. um, I actually uh, Dillian actually called me uh, the night as in March, uh, the night before. I think a couple of nights before he actually flew out and said to me, "Oh, I need you out." in Portugal. Um, so I said, okay, I had to pack up all my stuff. And it was just before uh, everything happened with Corona. So I um, made my way out there. And the whole idea was obviously to continue being his second. Um, uh, because obviously Mark Tiz was, was his head trainer. So we were just working, working out there, getting ready for the uh, initial date, which I think was maybe May 2nd or 4th. Uh, I can't remember exactly what date it was. And then, um, you know, things happened and, and then we move on. And I want to ask you this, Zev, because obviously it's a huge, huge fight. It's another risky one for Dillian. Um, was Dillian able to get, you know, good enough sparring in? Because that's my only worry. Uh, you don't have to worry about that. Yeah, he's had, he's had very, very good sparring. I even brought um, one of my guys out there to spar with Dillian as well. So, um, yeah, yeah it, Dillian's had a, he had a very good camp. I mean, it's, it's never easy to relocate, have to set everything up, up and... Uh, you know, basically just set up camp and be just stuck and settled in one place. But, you know, everybody's made the effort to get out there. Um, you know, strength and conditioning team was out there. Um, I'm not sure how many members in total actually end up flying out to Portugal, maybe around the 18 to 20 figure. Wow. Um, so he had his whole team out there. So, um, yeah, there's no issues in that respect, honestly. It's been... It's been a very good camp. Excellent to hear. Under the circumstances, very good. Yeah, excellent to hear. Um, also, again, for those that don't know, like I say, or like you said, you know, you were almost uh, mentored by Don Charles. You've been part of that setup down there. 
um, f- for a long time. Just again, for those that don't know, which other fighters are you currently training, Zev? Because I know you had a bunch of guys, obviously fighting on Steve Goodwin's cards. What are some of the other guys that you that you train? I've got I've got so many fighters. I suppose out of respect for the conversation, we've better talk about the guys that have either won titles recently or about to fight for titles. Um, they would be K Prosper. Uh, he's the current English champion. Just defended his belt in March. I've also got a very good kid called uh, Super Yusuf Kamari. Um, Dillian's taken a real liking to him, and now he's uh, he's going to manage manage Yusuf. Uh, so he'll be um, he'll, he should be on a matchroom show soon, probably in the next month or a couple of months. Um, I've also got another kid called Super Featherweight called Dennis Wahom, Dennis uh, the Menace. Super Featherweight. He's about to challenge for the English title. Um, I've got a lot of fighters. Like I said, um, I'd be here all day. <laughs> but you know, a lot of them uh, I've built them. Um, pretty amateurs as well, so they're you know getting themselves in detention for titles. Excellent, man. I remember you telling me about Yusuf Kamari. I think the first time we ever met a few years back, you know. So uh, yeah, good stuff, man. Obviously for this yeah. for this matchroom fight camp, Dillian's ordered in this American RV. <laughs> Are you sleeping on board the RV as well, Zav? <laughs> no, we, we the rest of the team we've all got our rooms at the uh, Holiday Inn. So. Okay, cool. Now, Dylan, Dylan, Dylan always does, does things a little bit different, so you know, it's, that's I'll leave him to it. But he's, uh, yeah, he looks comfortable. He's, you know, in good shape and he's ready to go. And just coming down to the final couple questions, Zav, I appreciate you giving me this time. So let's just get down to this fight here. Dillian against Alexander Povetkin. You know, it's, it's, it's predicted by many this will be one of Dillian's toughest fights. I'm sure he's prepared for it like it will be the toughest fight. How do you feel the fight's going to unfold, Zav? Uh, in my personal opinion, I think this is Dillian's toughest fight of his career. Um, the reason I say that is because of what's on the line. Um, you know, he's very close to getting a title shot. Um, Kovetkin's one of the most experienced guys that Dillian would have fought. Um, you know, it's only the likes of uh, Klitschko and Joshua that beat him. Only Joshua stopped him. Um, he's boxed so many different styles. He's a gold medalist. I mean, the guy is, he's for real. And, uh, you know, Dillian, again, deserves a lot of respect for getting in with these guys but you know I, I agree with him you know you, you, you have to get yourself in, in with these guys to get prepared to fight for a world title so he's doing exactly what he should be doing he's staying active and um, you know I, I, as I said to everybody else expect a good performance I don't really do predictions um, all I want is a W and that's the only thing that matters to me uh, regardless of what happens in that fight there's always going to be those that are going to praise what's going on those that are going to critique it but you know that's what we're here to do. You know we're just here to work and just get and just get the victory the best way we know how. And finally, Zav, just for our listeners, if anyone wants to follow you on any social media platforms, I don't know if you're on Twitter, but anyway, what are your what are your handles for everyone to follow you? Instagram, oh, Twitter. You're gonna you're gonna laugh, but I joined Twitter about two weeks ago. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I I haven't got a clue what I'm doing yet, and I haven't had the time to even play about with it, but um. Yeah, Instagram I've been using for a long time, and that's simply because of the, you know, I've got very good sponsors. You know, I've got Tiger Bay, I've got Bravos, I've got Ealing Boards and Timbers, and I've got a clothing company called KMT. Um, so, you know, I, I, I post their, their products online regularly. But, yeah, my Instagram is uh, IQ, and it's uh, just Xavier Miller, X-A-B-I-E-R Miller. Um, yeah, I've got quite a good following, actually, on, on, on Instagram. Um, but, yeah, I, I've got... I, I've had to get myself used to this whole social media world, you know, because I'm pretty old school. So, but yeah, it's been interesting. <laughs> okay, everyone, follow Xavier there on Instagram at IQ Xavier Miller. Also, I second the the shout out to those to those sponsors. Shout out to those guys. And just uh, just before I let you go, Xavier, I just want to say it's, it's been great catching up with you. It's been a while, of course, me, me and yourself. Best of luck on Saturday with Dillian, and I hope we can speak again soon, my man. Oh, most definitely, and and th- thanks for the time. You know, it's, um, you know, it's good to catch up with you as well. Like I said, um, uh, we and I know we've we've got the the big platforms out there, but you know, you have to remember that you know you guys all put in the same amount of work, and uh, everyone deserves the time. You know, and it's, it's not, it's, I'm trying to get, to give as many interviews as I can. I've had to stall them all till this week because it's just been it's just been hectic. You know, hectic. You know, being over in Portugal and having and then coming flying over here and then setting up again over here. So it has been busy, but. Yeah, respect to you guys, man. You work hard.
Thank you, Xavier. I appreciate those words. But this wraps up episode 253 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. A massive thank you to the former WBO Super Featherweight World Champion, Mr. Barry Jones, for being with me for the duration of the show. A massive thank you to our three guests on this week's podcast, the undefeated WBO European Champion, Archie Sharp, the undefeated WBA World Champion, Brandon Figueroa, and last but not least, the new trainer of Dillian White, Mr. Xavier Miller. There has been one piece of news break whilst we've been recording the show. Daniel Dubois' fight against Eric Pfeiffer has fallen through. Uh, Eric Pfeiffer couldn't uh, pass a medical, I believe it was. Daniel will now be fighting Ricardo Snyders of the Netherlands. The former cruiserweight boasts a record of 18-1, and one, and that loss came to Joel Jekko in May of last year. Uh, he fights Dubois on August 29th. But that's about everything from myself. Thank you all for listening and tuning into this week's podcast once again. Enjoy your weekends, people. Stay safe, and we shall see you all again next week.